So welcome to our event, our event. My name is Professor Claire Smith and I'm Head of Anatomy and it's a pleasure to have you with us this evening and I'd like to introduce the rest of the team that are here to support our event. Hi, my name is Dominic O'Brien. I'm one of the lecturers in anatomy here at Brighton and Sussex Medical School. Hello, my name is Dr. Michel Koenig. I'm one of the histopathologists in the Royal Sussex County Hospital here in Brighton and I'll be talking to you about pathology today a bit, little bit. We're also supported by running round, Bruno, our anatomy technician, and Geets, our anatomy pro sector, who's helped us with the specimens. Um, you'll notice that because of health and safety, whilst we've all been vaccinated, um, the individual who's speaking will, will not be wearing a mask to help with clarity, and the rest um, at that point in time will be wearing a mask. So we're going to take you on a journey, and we're going to have you you know, see inside some insides and some intestines. Um, the specimens we're using are going to be a mixture of both animal and human. Um, and if you can, we'll have a look at the next on the slide as well. It's just a few things to go to go through. Next slide, thank you. So some of these are, we have permission to use any cadaveric images or cadaveric specimens, but it's really important that they're not for onward sharing um, or taking screenshots or particularly sharing on social media. So we do ask you to be respectful of that. So we're gonna start in the gastrointestinal system. And I want you to think about your gastrointestinal system when you were developing as a little tiny embryo. It started its life off as this little tube and the tube got longer and longer and longer. And it started to fold to enable it to all fit inside the abdomen. But actually it got too big for the little baby's abdomen. So it pops out of the tummy um, whilst the, the whole baby is still developing. And it kind of twists and turns a little bit. And then normally it goes back in before being born. On average, um, the whole tract is about seven to eight meters in length, and it takes about six to eight hours for your system to get food to go all the way through your system. Thank you, Bruno. And it all starts in the mouth. So what I'd like you to do now is to put your hand on the side of your head about just in front of your ear and just gently open your mouth and close your mouth and see if you can feel the muscles working. The muscles that help us chew are known as the muscles of mastication and they help macerate and churn up the food in our mouth. And that gets that food ready into a food bolus, um, which means we can then swallow it. The other thing that happens in our mouth is that we can taste structures. And this is undertaken by some really special things called the taste buds. And if you want to try this out at home, you're welcome to. All you need to do is to get some um, blue food dye that you'd use in uh, cooking, gently put it on to um, a little cotton bud and gently sort of just scrape it over your tongue. Your, the little papillae, the taste buds, will pick up that food dye and you can see them in little circles on the edges of the tongue. Children have more taste buds than adults. So if you're, if you're a child and you try this, compare it to um, any adults around you. So quick question, how much saliva do you think that you might produce in a day? I'm going to ask the team in here in case anyone. No pressure. Geeks, what do you think? One litre, you are correct with one litre. <laughs> well done. <laughs> it is about the same as three cans of your favourite fizzy drink. Um, it is one litre. So actually, this shows you as a real health message to make sure that you're, you're drinking a lot of water a day because you're making it um, to help. And saliva is important. It helps lubricate the mouth. It contains enzymes to start breaking down food. And we're now going to move on to the, the food pipe, the esophagus. It's about 25 centimetres long, and you can see it sits at the back of the windpipe. The yellow on the screen is the cartilage in the trachea or the windpipe, and the esophagus is at the back. And it helps protect us. Um, and 
something that's really important in us as species as humans is we have a gag reflex and a vomiting reflex. And this is actually a highly evolved system that helps protect us from any poisons or mold or anything we might take into our system. So the next time you're gagging or vomiting, actually think that it's actually a highly sophisticated thing that you're actually doing and is really important. We're going to look now at our pig specimen, um, which has um, its standard food grade um, specimen. So if you're a little bit squeamish, maybe look away now. And we're going to have a look and find the esophagus before we move on to have a look at the stomach. So this is our set of pig's intestines. Okay, really quite, quite large, so slightly sort of larger in some parts than us, but it gives us an excellent comparison. So what I'm moving around here is the stomach, and we can then see this is the esophagus. So in us, it's only about 25 centimeters long, so probably about that long in us. It is this muscular tube, and actually it's such a great muscular tube, it means that you can actually, you can swallow upside down. If you ever want to try this, um, then take a little bit of food into your mouth, do a headstand or a handstand, have someone near you in case of any accidents, and you'll, you'll find you can swallow upside down. So this beautiful esophagus is then heading into this structure, which is the stomach. Now, Dominic's going to tell us about the stomach before we cut into it. Over to you, Dominic. Thank you very much, Claire. So as you can see here, Claire's taken us all the way down the esophagus, and then we come into this much larger portion of the anatomy here, which is the stomach. Now, the stomach is basically just a very large bag of muscles for the food to enter into. Um, the digestion process, as mentioned, has started all the way up at the mouth, which will be at the end of the esophagus here. It's worked its way down. And then in the stomach, it's going to be churned around. There's going to be some stomach acid added. Um, and that's going to help to break down the food even more, which is then going to allow us to get all of those nutrients out of it. Um, now, your stomach, as you can see here, is quite big. Um, so it can hold around about a litre's worth of food once it's all uh, been kind of chewed up and then it's down here being digested. Um, there are quite a lot of folds in the stomach as well, uh, which you'll hopefully see when we open it up. And basically what that allows it to do is to expand and then contract, depending on how much food you've actually got in your stomach at any one time. Um, there's a, a lot of processes that can kind of tell your brain how full your stomach is. Unfortunately, it's not the quickest thing ever. Um, so it can take about 20 minutes for your brain to process that your stomach is actually full. So that's why you always think you can eat more and then feel the regret afterwards uh, when your stomach's just that little bit too stretched and you just kind of need to lie down. Um, that's governed by a lot of hormones and kind of signaling up and down to the brain. Um, and whilst it's doing that, um, I'm sure you'll have all experienced your stomach grumbling at some point. Uh, that's got a really fancy name called barbarygmia. Um, and I'm sure you'll notice that when you're particularly hungry, the grumble is a little bit louder. And that's basically because there's no food in your stomach to muffle it. Um, so that's why your stomach will grumble all the time, regardless of whether it's full or not. But it will be louder just before lunchtime. Should we have in there? <laughs> Against my better judgment, yes, we absolutely should. <laughs> so the stomach continues into the small intestine, a particular part which is known as the duodenum. And the duodenum's really special. It's got um, some glands in it that help protect from the acid of the stomach, but it's also where the organs of the pancreas and the liver put their secretions into. The duodenum then continues... Oh, sorry, carrying on with that one. We just meant to say about the stomach, actually. Sometimes people can swallow things in their stomach and they show up nicely on x-ray, which is an example here. Um, we've carried on with, we've gone through this bit. Yeah, sorry. So we head into the small intestine and this is really where all the nutrients get absorbed. And it's comprised of three different parts, the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And the process of peristalsis moves the food along the tube. And we're going to have a look at the small intestine now um, on, on our um, pig stomach, on our pig. 
So Dominic and I, before we went live, um, because we couldn't resist because this is what we're like. We're anatomists. We love cutting into things. Um, so we spent a little bit of time uh, cutting out the small intestine because actually the small intestine is completely rooted to the back of your abdominal wall um, by this structure Dominic's got there. And this is called the mesentery. And actually it's a very kind of thick connective tissue like structure there. And actually this means that in this short part that Dominic's got there, all of these intestines here were all attached to it. And they were attached very much like this to it. Now the bits we've cut through, but I can show you beautifully by holding it up to the light. Can you see these nice pink strands that head towards it? And these are the blood vessels these ones running along here that are taking the good oxygenated blood to the gut, but also the veins that will be drawing, going back towards the liver with the products of digestion. Um, and we can carry this all the way along. Now, Dominic, do you want to get some scissors and cut into it at one point? Um, and we'll see what we can find in it. You choose a point. Oh, you're not good at making decisions. <laughs> So this particular part here is really quite thin. He's chosen a really challenging bit to cut live on camera. Um, we can't see any food in it, which is actually probably a very good part. And he's done really well and hasn't gone through it. There's a little bit of, it's called chyme at this point, um, food coming out of it. But if we open it up and show it up to the camera, um, you might be able to see again some of those folds that Mitya is going to um, show us in a minute. It is amazing that all of this, all of this is curled with inside us. Now, what's lovely is if you, for any reason, you have to take the small intestines out during an operation and then you put them back in, they kind of sit on a little bag on the side of the patient and you put them back in, you can plonk them back in pretty much like that. And as you can see, they all move around into their natural resting place. And this is helped by that mesentery. That is beautiful. And you can actually see how thin that is as well. So it's quite easy to understand how at some point you might be able to perforate or have a hole in your intestinal system. Okay. I think over to you, Mitch, unless you wanted us to show anything else of the small intestine. No, I can take over okay. and have a quick look at what That's that what looks that like. So if we go just back here, this is the actual system that we use for our students as well in, uh, in BSMS at the Brighton Medical School. And this is how we teach about the small intestine. Here is something that we have um, a transverse section. So a similar plane as the previous sections that we have. So this is a transverse section through human small intestine. And again, the same organizational principles apply. So we have here in the middle, you can see a little bit of food. So maybe we can, can we spot anything specific? This is plant matter here. So this is, this is probably chewed up plant matter. So this is your food. Uh, as you would look at it, if you were a tiny little microscopic creature wandering through your small intestine. So that is what it, what it would look like. So this is the inside. And then we have again our surface tissue. And I will go to that in, in a little bit um, greater detail. Blood vessels here again coming in and serving blood to all these tissues so that they can um, uh, survive and have enough oxygen available for their um, homeostasis. And then on the outside, we have the thick muscle again. And you can see the two layers again, one layer here and one layer here. But the really impressive thing, because when we're looking at what Claire just has shown us, um, it is a relatively flat appearing small intestinal surface, but in fact, it is not flat at all. And you can see that here. So there are loads and loads of folds, and that is not the end of it. Because on top of these folds, we have villi, intestinal villi. And the best ones are probably seen here, where they are sort of nicely cut longitudinally. So here we have the main wall with the muscle on the left side. And this is the surface tissue, the mucosa. And what we have here is a finger-like projection into the lumen. 
And the things that we're looking at here, these round islands that seem to be floating like a meandering chaos in this, in this uh, specimen, they are all similar villi that are cut in a different plane because we're looking at a two-dimensional representation of a very complex three-dimensional organ. So these are all villi. So if we zoom out again, you can see that there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of villi. And that is the reason why we have so much surface area available to get all the things that are available um, uh, within our food to be resorbed out of that into our bloodstream and then off to the liver here. So that is that villi, 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 villi. But it's still not the end because if we go in a little bit more even, what we can just about see, when I really, really magnify this very, very hard, and now we're at about 100 times magnification, we need to multiply that by 10. So this cell that we're looking at here is magnified by a factor of 1,000, actually. So this is what we, we're looking at here. So this is a cell uh, that is our surface cell of the small intestine, but there is another layer over the top. These are microvilli. They are so tiny that our scanning system and our microscopes cannot really show them. All we can see is this sort of fuzzy brush border here between this line and this line. So each of our thousands and thousands and thousands of villi actually is covered in microvilli, like hairs. And that is the reason why we have so much surface area um, available in a, well, relatively long six meter tube, but in many ways also right, quite short tube um, to get all these uh, nutrients that go through the middle here out um, and make them then available for us in, in, the, uh, in the liver. One way how this goes wrong, I can show you here. So if you go back to the presentation, and we're looking at this now, and this is a small intestinal abnormality. This is a disease called celiac disease. On the left here, again, I have uh, a normal picture of normal small intestine, and these are the finger-like villi that I have just talked about. So again, here on the surface, we would have this brushed border that we can't really see at this magnification, which is roughly maybe 100 or so. But this is what it should look like. Now, in celiac disease, celiac disease is essentially an autoimmune disease. It's an allergy. You can think of it as an allergy to gluten, gluten that is found in wheat, and like bread and other things. And what happens is that this gluten causes the small intestine to become inflamed. So what we can see here is roughly the same magnification as the picture on the left, but there are no villi on the top any longer. The surface is completely flat, and most of this tissue that we can see here is, is very, very blue, and blue cells are inflammatory cells. So this mucosa is full of inflammation. And if we were to magnify it a little bit more, um, then we would see these are all lymphocytes uh, in, in various mixtures that, uh, that are here uh, taking over this, this surface tissue. And what that, of course, means is that this surface tissue looks very different from here. There are no villi left. And that is why malabsorption is one of the clinical symptoms in celiac disease. And that's why celiac disease presents with gastrointestinal abnormalities for these patients. Okay. That's it. Thank you. So I think we're going to move on to have a look at the large intestine, um, which Dominic is going to tell us about. So we'll go on to the PowerPoint, I think. Thank you. So yes, yeah, so the large intestine, rather than focusing on nutrients being reabsorbed, is mainly about water. And um, so that's, again, uh, feeding into what uh, Professor Smith was saying earlier. Remember to drink a lot of water because uh, your body needs it. Um, another thing that uh, is quite important to consider when you're thinking about your large intestine is that it is where you will find your appendix, uh, which is quite a, quite a common ailment that people have where their appendix becomes inflamed, and that's called appendicitis. And that can mean that you have to have a small operation to get your appendix removed. And uh, keeping your colon or your large intestine healthy uh, is really important 
Um, and you can do that by increasing the amount of fiber uh, in your diet and reducing things like uh, red and processed meat. Uh, about 95% of the serotonin that your body produces, which is one of the happy chemicals that you like, uh, is actually produced by your gastrointestinal tract. So if you have a happy tummy, it makes you a bit happier as well. And I think now we're going to move Excellent. over and look at the actual one. We're going to have a look at it for real, which is, means um, more smells for us. So this la our large intestine in ourselves, um, if you put your hand over roughly sort of the right lower, lower part of your tummy, so just above where you might think your kind of hip is, um, that's where your large intestine starts and that's where the appendix is. So if you get an appendicitis, you might get pain around that region. And then the intestine goes sort of up to just where your ribs are. So if you feel where your ribs are on your right hand side, um, that's where it goes up to. And then it goes across the body and then back down on the left hand side. So slightly different in a pig because obviously they, they walk around on all fours um, in terms of its orientation. Uh, but if Dominic and I squirrel it around a little bit, we'll find we're tracking that small intestine here. Oh, is that way? Beautiful. Um, tracking that small intestine here as it comes into the large intestine. Part of the large intestine is this little kind of sac area which is known as a cecum. And inside the cecum is where it helps ruminate and process food. Horses have really large cecums because they eat a lot of grass. Um, and then it carries on through this large intestines. We wiggle it all around this way. And eventually the large intestine ends up going into a structure known as the sigmoid colon, which is here. And the sigmoid colon ends eventually in the cow's, in the pig's bum, which is the anus, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I just want you to get your orientation onto that. Um, Dominic's really keen. He's already got his scissors ready to go. Um, so keen, I can kind of tap it, bat it, bow it. Over to you, Dominic, cut into it. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. I feel like we haven't learned a lesson from earlier. I know, we should have. <laughs> <laughs> you can kind of guess where this is going to go. We're Actually, have a little think and a talk amongst yourselves. Are you expecting it to be thicker or runnier than what it was before? So again, it's still quite thin-walled. Um, Dominic's quite easy to get into there. He's cutting a little window. You can see he's even actually able to pull it apart with his hands quite easily. Sometimes this is a method known as blunt dissection, um, which we use with humans and surgeons use as well. Not so much pulling with their hands, but kind of gently going in there. Okay, so there's a lot of food in there. And actually, I'm going to be really quite gross. So I hope you're not eating. It is actually quite, it's a lot thicker, isn't it? Um, than what we saw in the small intestines. Um, the parts of the food which are undigested in here still remain. So if you're in, if this was human, um, we might see bits of sweet corn and wheat and things like that in there. Um, but it's quite a lot thicker. And part of the job of the large intestine is to be absorbing water into it. Bruno's looking at me really cross now because I'm making mess <laughs> to clear up. Um, but it is looking really it's really nice what else can we say about the large intestine just uh, thinking you might see that it's kind of arranged into all of these slightly more pinched oh, I love these bits. Bits, yeah. um called hastration and uh, that's basically uh, in keeping with the idea that this peristaltic movement is constantly happening so you see where these bunches are together that's basically happening because you get these uh, constant movements of your intestines to move um, the contents of their own system as well. So, what you need to do is that this is kind of the way that it's going to be true. So, you just have to use your hands and then just move it all the way down so that you can get to the end nice and easily. Very nice. Right. Fantastic. Can I just 
keep you here for one moment because what I'm going to show you is a bit of abnormality of the large intestine. And Dom, if you could just show us the thickness of the wall again and the smoothness of the mucosa. If you just avert that a little bit. And if we look at this in a little bit more detail, if we look at the inside here, yeah? And if we clean that off a little bit, we can see that the surface, the inner surface, has these folds that we have mentioned, but overall it is relatively smooth. This is probably a little bit thinner than we would expect it in actual humans, but the surface is overall very smooth. Now, if you compare this to this abnormal specimen here, and what you can see here, and let's just try and get this maybe in a little bit more focus like that maybe. What I'm trying to show you here, and I also have pictures um, in, in the presentation, I show it a little bit better, is that this mucosa here is much, much thicker and much, much more nodular. It looks a little bit like cobblestones. And this is an actual human specimen. And this is a, a very specific abnormality that we see in, in pathology uh, in, in uh, uh, certain conditions of the large intestine that I'm going, now I'm going to talk to you about. And this is called a cobblestone pattern. And I'm probably going to be able to show you that in the presentation a little bit better. If we just switch over to that, Bruno, fantastic. Yes, here it is. So let me just quickly get um, a laser pointer and then I can show you that a little bit more. So what I'm trying to show you is this here, this pattern. So this should be very small. This is colon that we're looking at. But in fact, we're looking at almost like a cobblestone street. So we have these little cobblestones that remain here and here on the left as well. This is a more fresh picture as uh, it would appear when it was just open, for example, in the context of an operation. So here, these structures here, they are cobblestones. And what happened here is this is an inflammatory condition of the uh, large intestine, which produces this pattern. The pattern is produced that the Again, similar to uh, celiac disease, the mucosa becomes inflamed and then dies off. And what remains, what we're looking at here, almost like a valley down here, that is actually the muscle that surrounds the mucosa. And that is the muscle that produces the peristalsis to move food forward towards um, the bottom uh, later. So what we're looking at here is the wall directly. And in, in that sense, the cobblestones are produced by the tissue around them disappearing. And that is exactly the, the, the pattern that we can see here. This is what this looks like by endoscopy. So luckily, we of course have the opportunity or the possibility to look at the, uh, the colon relatively easily by inserting an endoscope. Um, and that means inserting it into the bottom and pushing it forward, sort of, well, retrograde, backward, if you like, um, into the colon. And that enables us to inflate the colon a little bit with air and uh, use water, and then to actually look at the surface of the colon on the inside in the, in the living patient. And here we can see this is what it looks like. It's a little bit fuzzy because there's water around. And of course, patients move during this procedure. This is usually done under light anesthesia. So it is actually a procedure that is very well tolerated by patients. And it is done hundreds and hundreds of times every day all over the NHS. And here is the similar pattern. Here is a cobblestone and all of this is ulceration. So here the surface has disappeared. And this is just a different way of seeing the same thing. All this whitest tissue is, is, is the remaining mucosa and everything in between is the disappearing inflammation. So this is um, cobblestone pattern or cobblestone inflammation. And this is typical for two conditions of the colon that are again inflammatory conditions. And one of them is ulcerative colitis. And this is an example that we can see here. And the other one is Crohn's disease. Both of these are very enigmatic conditions that we have again, um, an inflammatory process in the colon that has to do with some kind of autoimmune reaction to luminal contents, to anything that is in the bowel, but we don't quite understand yet what exactly goes wrong. But 
The effect is inflammation of the of the inner surface of the, of the colon and this is one area like this so this is a colon that has been opened so again what claire has mentioned this would be the cecum in humans and then we have the ascending colon here and the transverse colon here and descending colon on the other side and down here we have the sigmoid and the rectum then and the anus and we can see here this is an, an enormous amount of, uh, of inflammation. This would traditionally present, of course, as a bloody diarrhea condition um, that is a typical presenting symptom for this kind of abnormality of the colon. What does it look like? Just briefly, I will show you. So we go back, and now I have, of course, forgotten where do I need to go. So this is number five, okay? So we go in backwards here. And then here, number five, here we are. This is a different example. This is Crohn's disease, a similar uh, condition, but with, with slight differences, but it is also an inflammatory condition. And this is what it looks like. Again, we're looking at a uh, transverse section of the colon here. And with a similar pattern here is the mucosa. And then we have our tissue underneath with blood vessels. And then the red line here is again, our muscle. And what we can see is a lot and a lot and a lot of blue. And I've alluded to it, blue is inflammation. And you can see how much inflammation there is. There is even inflammation outside here, on the outside of the colon. So this would be visible um, on the outside of the colon when it is, for example, removed. In certain stages of the disease, uh, only the removal of the colon would act will actually be helpful for the patient. Um, so that is all inflammatory tissue. And you can see the large amount of inflammation that is going on here in, in, in this section. Right. So that is that. And what is special about Crohn's disease, again, that is the second um, inflammatory condition I want to mention here, and because it is one of the um, charities that we're supporting today is um, a charity that uh, supports patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Here again, we have beautiful, beautiful, well, for us to look at beautiful, not for the patient, of course, cobblestone pattern with these large cobblestones of the mucosa. So that is the abnormality. And in Crohn's disease, the inflammatory process is actually so strong that it can go through the entire wall of the colon here and create thickening of the colonic wall. And it also create, can create connections to other organs. So that is what the arrow here shows. This is called a fistula. That is this word here, fistula on the side. This was an abnormal connection here between the colon and in this case, the bladder. So here, this is the bladder surface and there is a connection here. And this is not allowed. This should not happen. And this is a consequence of the inflammatory process that is going on here in, in this colon. Right. That is all I have to say about um, the inflammatory conditions. We're about 10 minutes from the end. Question, should we look at cancer? Should we not look at cancer? Or should we rather go into q and I think maybe um, we should go into Q&A. Maybe q &A. We've just got the last little bit of... Uh anus the last little bit of the let's do that show, maybe. let's do and that then and then questions. answer some questions yes if we haven't put people off their dinners certainly anything not. that they've got certainly so, not. um one of the things that you're if we can have we can have this one back on thank you one of the things that you'll all be really pleased about is that hopefully um you've got control over when you choose to go to the toilet um, and actually, again, it's a it's a highly sophisticated system of this last part of the colon, the sigmoid colon, goes into a kind of little storage pouch part of the tube known as the rectum. And the rectum is then joined in to the final part, the anus. So this part, we're looking at the pig's bum. Um, and this is where the we or the urine would come out just here. And this is where the poo comes out just here. If we look just inside, we can see some parts of muscle tissue here. And this is part of the sphincters. Um, and sphincters are muscular structures that go around tubes in the body and help us enable when we wish to control 
when that happens. So when you want to have a poo and you know that it's a good time and a place to have a poo, um, actually what your rectum has to do is it slightly straightens itself up. Those sphincters actually relax and then allow the poo to go down um, into, into the toilet. We've got our last slide to have a look at now, um, which is all about burps and farts, um, because this is the other part of our digestive system, as well as getting food out, we also have some air to get out. So whether they're, whether they're bur burps or farts, they are created from the air that's inhaled in, we breathe in during talking, eating or drinking, and also created as part of the digestive process. And that air has to get out somehow. So no matter what people tell you, most people will pass wind or fart between about 14 to 23 times a day. And you can decide for yourself who in your household um, does that the most and that equates to roughly a kind of about three pints worth of of air thank you very much um, for joining us if you've got any questions um, then please do put them in the chat and um, if you ever want to know anything about your body or you've got us any feedback or questions um, you can always contact us at uh, anatomy at bsms dot ac dot uk if you can kindly put that last slide sorry up bruno thank you um sorry the one with the no that one perfect um if you'd like to, we've been using animal tissue and human tissue today if what we've been saying about raises any questions for you about body donation then again email us at anatomy at bsms.ac.uk and if you'd like to read more or find out about body donation um then your self-promotion and um, my book the silent teacher the gift of body donation is available from all good retailers so i'm just going to have a look in the chat to see if you put any questions in how big is the human stomach in height oh how big is human stomach in height that's a really good question and if bruno you could go back to the slide i did have some photographs of different sizes of stomachs um, because it really does vary and it varies on um, actually partly how sort of tall your thorax is um if you can see, yeah if you could drop that onto the main thing thank you so the first stomach you can see um is slightly sort of fatter um, but looks like it contains a lot. The second one looks slightly stretched and elongated. Um, and the third one actually quite relatively small. Um, I'm looking at my colleagues around me. When we see stomachs, I can go back to that, back to that one. When we see stomachs inside of people, um, I think they vary from anything, I'm looking around, about kind of that, diam that diameter. Aidan's nodding, Dominic's yeah, okay. nodding. Um, about, yeah, about that long, slightly curved, so probably about that big. Next question. Next question comes from Samuel Arnold. Hello, Samuel. Uh, Samuel would like to know, why is poo brown? Oh, that's a great question, Samuel. Why is poo brown? Um, never really thought about it poo's brown <laughs> poo's brown because of the digestive processes um if you ever look really closely at your poo samuel which um you might you can ask your mum to have a look at you might be able to see some sweet corn some sort of yellowy parts of that but why else is it brown well it has to do with um essentially the um the processes that go on in the liver that then process food for example and it's not just for processing food it, it is also for uh, processing waste products of the body and these waste products are largely responsible for the color um, because they are then uh, secreted into uh, the gastrointestinal system as well and they give uh, uh, this brown color I think it's also good to know that most people's poos are brown of a roughish type of color so you know that if your poo isn't brown then that's definitely something to go and see your doctor about Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're going to say goodnight now and clean up the mess that we've made. Um, and we hope that you all have a lovely evening. So thank you very much for joining us. Take care and we'll see you soon. <laughs>